Welcome to week 22 of our course MEC 410. This week we're going to study breaks and clutches. Your homework assignment consists of problems in the textbook as shown on the next few slides, but because there's a lot of missing design inputs into the problems in the textbook, I've defined for you inputs for the problems. And this will be a document that is stored in Blackboard. Clutches are found in all transmissions. The driver actuates the clutch in a manual transmission, and the clutch is automatically engaged in an automatic transmission. A clutch is used to connect or disconnect a driven component from the prime mover of the system. In a machine that must cycle frequently, the driving motor is left running continuously and a clutch is interposed between the motor and the driven machine. Then the clutch is cycled on and off to connect and disconnect the load. This permits the motor to operate at an efficient speed and permits the system to cycle correctly. In the case of an automobile, we have a diagram on the bottom that shows all the components in the clutch system. The clutch is situated in between the engine as depicted here on the left with the crankshaft and the transmission here on the right. And the clutch consists of the flywheel, pilot bearing, clutch disc, pressure bearing, release bearing, input shaft, and release fork. Normally, when the engine is properly transmitting power to the transmission, the three discs here shown, the flywheel, clutch disc, and pressure plate are pressed together. That allows the torque to be properly transmitted from the crankshaft all the way through the clutch to the input shaft of the transmission. The release fork is a device that pulls the pressure plate away from the clutch disc, which is done manually by pressing down on the clutch pedal in a manual transmission. It's done automatically in the automotive transmission. And when the pressure plate is pulled away from the clutch disc and the torque is not transmitted from the crankshaft to the input shaft. Brakes are found in all vehicles. A brake being a device used to bring a moving system to rest, to slow it down, or to control its speed to a certain value. On the left, we have a picture of a bicycle caliper brake with the pads squeezing against the rims of the wheel when you depress the brake lever with your hands. And on the right, we have a diagram of an automotive disc brake, which we show in detail on this slide. The caliper, this red piece, is the housing that fits over the rotor and holds the brake pads and pistons, as well as contains ducting for the brake fluid. The piston is a cylinder connected to the brake system hydraulics. The piston moves the brake pads into the rotor when the driver presses the brake pedal. The rotor is this smooth circular disc bolted to the wheel hub that spins with the wheel, which is commonly made of steel. And the brake pads are the component that pushes into the rotor, creating the friction that slows and stops the car. The brake pad lining wears away with use. When you push on the brake pedal in the car, it increases the brake fluid pressure. That brake fluid pressure is amplified and pushes inside this caliper. The brake fluid increases the pressure inside the caliper, which forces the caliper and the mounted disc pad up against the rotor. There's different types of clutches and brakes. In a plate clutch, each friction surface is in the shape of an annulus on a flat plate, and one or more friction plates moves axially to contact a mating smooth plate, usually made of steel, to which the friction torque is transmitted. You have an actuator that presses the two plates together. The drive plate is on the input side of the system and the driven plate with its friction material is on the output side. When the two plates are pressed together, the torque is transmitted from the input shaft to the output shaft. A caliper disc brake is what we showed you for the automotive brake. It's a disc shaped rotor attached to the machine to be controlled friction pads covering a small portion of the disc. For example, here the friction pad is this distance of arc and the rotor is much larger. The friction pads 
covering only a small portion of the disc are contained in the caliper and they're forced against the disc by air pressure or hydraulic pressure. And this side view in our diagram showing the caliper system and the brake pad is analogous to a view looking from where my mouse is pointed across the rotor. A cone clutch or brake is similar to a plate clutch except that the mating surfaces are on a portion of a cone instead of on a flat plate. And here's your cone. Surface 1, surface 2, surface 3 of the friction material contacts this inner surface, the straight down surface, and the angled side surface on the mating part. In a band brake, the friction material is on a flexible band that nearly surrounds a cylindrical drum attached to the machine to be controlled. When braking is desired, the band is tightened on the drum, exerting a tangential force to stop the load. So here's your drum. The band is wrapped around the edge of the drum. The actuation force pulls down on this edge of the band, which then forces the band against the side of the drum, creating the friction force that slows the drum down. In a block or shoe brake, curved rigid pads faced with the friction material are forced against the surface of a drum from either the outside or the inside, exerting a tangential force to stop the load. In a short shoe brake, the actuation force pushes down on this lever, and this small arc section of the brake pad pushes on the side of the drum and creates a frictional torque that counters the momentum of the drum. So if the drum is moving in the clockwise direction, this brake shoe is applying a torque in the counterclockwise direction. In a long shoe brake, you have two large shoes on either sides of the drum and together the two shoes will push on roughly a third of the surface area of the side of the drum. Your actuation force pushes these two top points of the two shoes together which then forces brake pad right and the brake pad here on the left up against the side of the drum to slow it down. And you also have a manually actuated clutch or brake. I'm showing you the base of the driver's side of an automobile with the clutch pedal on the left, the brake pedal on the center, and the accelerate pedal on the right. And the clutch is generally operated mechanically in automotives by your left foot. Usually there's a cable that connects the clutch pedal to the clutch. The shaft lever linkage has lots of parts and pivots points, including a cross shaft and a release lever. And there's also an assembly that transfers the clutch pedal movement to a throwout bearing. In a spring applied clutch or brake, sometimes called a fail-safe design. The brake is applied automatically by springs unless there is some opposing force present. So if power fails, or if air pressure or hydraulic pressure is lost, or if the operator is unable to perform the function, the springs apply the brake and stop the load. And the concept may also be used to engage or disengage a clutch. Here in this diagram, a solenoid linkage is disconnected on the left-hand side if power fails, and that allows the spring force to apply the brakes automatically. In a pneumatic clutch or brake, compressed air is introduced into a cylinder or other chamber. The force produced by the pressure on a piston or diaphragm brings the friction surfaces into contact with the members connected to the load. Hydraulic systems use oil instead of air for higher braking forces. In the diagram on the left, normally this tube is flat and therefore the friction pad does not touch the drum and allows the drum to rotate normally. When the air is turned on, the tube expands as the brakes are applied and the friction pad is forced against the drum which slows it down. This is a diagram of an electrically actuated brake that's used in trailers. The large center circle here represents the hole through which the trailer spindle goes. 
The four smaller holes represent bolt holes, which are used to bolt the backing plate onto the brake flange, which sits behind the spindle. You have a magnet here. There is the primary shoe and the secondary shoe. And you have a couple of reactor springs. There's your actuating arm and an adjuster for small mechanical changes. The magnet in the backing plate has two connector wires which tap directly into the trailer wiring. When electricity is on, it magnetizes the brake magnet. That magnet is attracted to the drum face. When it contacts this area, the friction causes it to rotate which moves the actuating arm and pushes the shoe out against the drum. An electrical connection on the trailer plugs into the connector on the vehicle. There are electric wires running from the trailer connector back to each brake on the axle as well as to the trailer lights to create a complete circuit. When the driver steps on the brakes, it sends a current to the brake control in the vehicle. The brake control then sends a current back to the trailer to activate the brakes. Here's one brake maintenance video that you can watch, which shows how you maintain a caliper brake system. And here is a second brake maintenance video, which shows how you do maintenance work on a drum brake system that's generally used in trucks. The torque capacity of a clutch or brake depends on the power and speed of the driving motor. Per the formula, torque T equals C times P times K divided by N, where P is the power, T is the torque, N is the speed in RPM, C is a conversion factor, which you use for units, which is shown in the table on the right, defining the conversion factor C as a function of what units are being used for torque, power, and speed. And K is a service factor, which will be based on your application. The torque required is inversely proportional to the speed, and for this reason, you should locate the clutch or brake on the highest speed shaft in the system so that the required torque is a minimum. The size, cost, and response times are all typically lower when the torque is lower. The value of the K factor in the torque equation tends to be a design decision, and it's a lot like what you use for design factor N. For brakes on average conditions, use K equals 1. For clutches in light duty, use K equals 1.5. For heavy duty, use K equals 3. For clutches and systems having a variable loads, use a K factor at least equal to the factor by which the motor breakdown torque exceeds the full load torque. For a typical industrial motor, K equals 2.75. For a high starting motor, K equals 4. For clutches and systems driven by gasoline engines or diesel engines, it's recommended to use K equals 5. We can now calculate the time required to accelerate or decelerate a load. The fundamental equation is torque T equals I times alpha, where I is the mass moment of inertia of the components being accelerated, and alpha is the angular acceleration or angular deceleration. Usually, in such an analysis, we determine the torque required to produce a change in rotational speed, delta n, of a system in a given amount of time. Note that the change in n, delta n, divided by time t is equal to the acceleration. But it's also more convenient to express the mass moment of inertia in terms of the radius of gyration k, where k equals the square root of i divided by m, i being the mass moment of inertia, and m equal the mass, which equals the weight over g. k squared then equals i divided by m. Now we can calculate the torque and then the time required to accelerate or decelerate a load. Torque t equals i times alpha, but i equals wk squared over g, and alpha equals delta n over t. So then the torque t equals wk squared over g times delta n over small t, where small t is the time. The term wk squared 
is the inertia of the load. A large proportion of the components in a machine that are accelerated are in the form of cylinders, which includes gears and pulleys and bearings and shafts. We then can analyze more complex objects by considering them to be made solely from cylinders. The torque required to accelerate the pulley can be put into a more convenient form by noting that capital T for torque is usually expressed in pound foot, WK squared in pound foot squared and in RPM and time small t in seconds with G equal to 32.2 feet per second squared, torque T equals WK squared times delta N divided by 308 times small t and that's in pound foot. Now we can calculate the radius of a gyration K squared for hollow cylinders. K squared equals one half times the sum of R1 squared plus R2 squared, where R1 is the outer radius of the hollow cylinder and R2 is the inner radius. This equation falls from the fact that I equals M over two times R1 squared plus R2 squared for a hollow cylinder and K squared equals I divided by M. The volume of the hollow cylinder equals pi times R1 squared minus R2 squared times L and the weight W equals del sub W times V where del sub W is the weight density, in other words, weight per volume. The inertia WK squared is equal to del W times V times K squared because del W V equals capital W and that equals del sub W times pi times R1 squared minus R2 squared times L times R1 squared plus R2 squared divided by two. Then WK squared equals pi times del sub W times L over two times R1 to the fourth minus R2 to the fourth. In a special case for steel, where del sub W is 0.283 pounds per inch cubed, WK squared is equal to L times R1 to the fourth minus R2 to the fourth over 323.9, and that's in pound foot squared. This is example 22-1 to calculate the radius of a gyration for hollow cylinders. And we're going to calculate WK squared for the steel flat pulley cross section in the lower right corner. And roughly that steel flat pulley looks like the picture in the upper right corner. The pulley can be estimated as being made up of three components, each of which is a hollow cylinder. The WK squared for the total pulley is the sum of WK squared for each component. We will use the equation for a steel cylinder from figure 22-10, which is that WK squared equals R1 to the fourth minus R2 to the fourth times L over 323.9, because this is a cylinder made out of steel. For the first of our cylinders making up this steel flat pulley, R1 is 10 and R2 is nine and L is six. That gives us the big outer shape. 10 to the fourth minus nine to the fourth times six divided by 323.9 is equal to 63.7 pound foot squared. In part two, WK squared is equal to nine to the fourth minus three to the fourth times 0.75 over 323.9. We're calculating this intersection. Here's our nine, there is our three, and we're using 0.75 because we're calculating this inner section here. And in part three, WK squared is three to the fourth minus 1.5 to the fourth times four over 323.9 because we're calculating this inner hub. There is our three, radius three. Here's our radius one and a half. That's a hollow cylinder. And this one is only four inches wide. And that's 0.94 pound foot squared. Add up the three numbers and you get 79.64 pound foot squared.
Now we can relate the inertia on parallel shafts to the shaft on which the clutch operates. And we have to do that because the clutch is on one shaft of a transmission system, but there's components on other shafts in the same transmission. So we have to have a way to relate what we calculate for W squared on the shafts that are rotating where there isn't the clutch. And the effective formula is WK squared sub E, meaning the effective value of WK squared, is WK squared for a component times the ratio of N over N sub C squared, where N is the rotational speed of the component, and N sub C is the rotational speed of the clutch. And for that reason, it's common in order to minimize the size of the clutch that you need to put the clutch on the fastest rotating shaft. Then the WK squared values for the other shaft become smaller numbers when they get multiplied by the factor N over N sub C squared because N sub C is always a bigger number than n. Here is example 22-3 to calculate inertia and time to accelerate a system that's made up of two shafts. We want to compute the total inertia of the system in figure 22-12 as seen from this clutch which is going to be on the faster moving shaft. Then we compute the time required to accelerate the system from rest to a motor speed of 550 if the clutch exerts a torque of 240 pound-feet. The WK squared for the armature of the clutch, which must also be accelerated, is 0.22 pound-foot squared, which includes the 1.25 inch shaft. So we have a gear A, which has got diametral pitch of six and diameter four, face width two and a half. And we have gear B, which also has a diametral pitch six but it has a larger diameter, D, of 11 inches, same face width of 2.5. We have this pulley in the system, which is identical to the pulley we just calculated, WK squared, and then we use the resultant, which is 79.64. We have the shaft that gear B is on and the pulley is on, and that shaft is a 3-inch diameter and 15 inches long. We have our clutch shaft, which is 1.25 inch uh, diameter, but its WK squared value is included in the WK squared for the armature of the clutch. That was the 0.22 pound foot squared number. Here in the upper left corner, I've created an input table that summarizes all of the information we need to solve this problem. In step one, we know that the clutch and gear A will be rotating at 550 RPM, but because of the gear reduction, gear B, its shaft, and the pulley rotate at 550 RPM times 24 over 66, which equals 200 RPM, and that falls out from the fact that D times PD for gear A is 24, and D times PD for gear B is 66. 550 times 24 over 66 is 200. Now we can compute the inertia for each element referred to the clutch speed, and we assume that the gears are cylinders having outside diameters equal to the pitch diameter of the gear and the inside diameter equal to the shaft diameter. Essentially, we're ignoring the subtlety of all the teeth having a slightly different shape and having a little more air in it than the rest of the gear. The equation in a figure 22-10 for a steel cylinder will be used. Therefore, gear A has a WK squared, which is equal to 2 to the 4th minus inside diameter 0 0.625 to the 4th times the Face width 2.5 divided by 323.9 comes out to 0.122 pound foot squared. Gear B has a value of a WK squared equals to its outer radius 5.5 to the fourth minus the inner radius 1.5 to the fourth, where the 1.5 inner radius of gear B is the diameter of shaft B. Then you multiply by the face width of gear B, which is 2.5 
divide out by 323.9 and wk squared equals 7.02. But because of the speed difference, we take the 7.02 pound foot squared for gear B and we divide out by the ratio of 200 over 550 squared so that as seen by the clutch, the effective wk squared value of gear B gets reduced down to 0.93 pound foot squared. The pulley from our prior problem had a WK squared value of 79.64, but this also gets multiplied by the ratio of 200 over 550 squared. And so the effective WK squared of that pulley gets reduced to 10.53 pound foot squared. For the shaft B, its WK squared value is 0.234 pound foot squared, which also gets reduced by our ratio of 200 over 550, and it's only 0.031 pound foot squared now. So when we calculate the total effective inertia seen by the clutch and we add up our five numbers, it's only 11.83 pound foot squared, even though the values of WK squared as seen by shaft B were much higher numbers. We can solve equation 22-3, was shown here on the left side for torque, and solve it for time. And all we have to do is just switch large t and small t in this equation. And then we get time equals the effective value of wk squared times delta n, which in our case is 550 minus 0, because the problem said we want to accelerate from stationary position to 550 rpm divide out by 308 times the torque T, which was 240, and it only takes 0.088 seconds to accelerate shaft A to the required value of 550 RPM. And this slide shows all the calculations in spreadsheet form that you need to solve the problem. Now we'll show you how to calculate the effective inertia for linear motion. We want to represent linear motion devices with an effective inertia measured by WK squared as we have for rotating bodies. And we want to do this in case the machine has both linear motion elements and rotary motion elements. We can accomplish a calculation for WK squared for the linear motion elements by relating the equations for kinetic energy for linear and rotary motion. The kinetic energy of a body moving with linear velocity v is ke equals one half mv squared which we can rewrite as wv squared over 2g and use the dimensions feet per minute for v the velocity. For a body rotating with angular velocity in radians per minute the kinetic energy is one half i omega squared, which we rewrite as a wk squared times omega squared over 2g. Then we set the quantities wv squared over 2g equal to the quantity wk squared omega squared over 2g. We then get wk squared is equal to w times v over omega quantity squared. Then we use the fact that omega equals a 2 pi n, so that the effective value of wk squared for linear motion is equal to w times the quantity v, the linear velocity, divided by 2 pi n a quantity squared. Here's an example, a 22-4, to calculate an effective inertia for parts on a conveyor. It says the conveyor in figure 22-13 moves at 80 feet a minute, and the combined weight of the belt and the parts on it is 140 pounds. Compute the equivalent WK squared inertia for the conveyor referred to the shaft driving the belt. And the drive shaft and the driven shaft have 10 inch diameter, which is a five inch radius. And the rotational speed of the shaft, omega, is the linear velocity of 80 feet per minute divided by the 5 inch radius. Doing a unit conversion between inches of feet, we then get that omega is 192 radians per minute. Then the equivalent wk squared is w times v over omega squared 
w is 140, v is 80, omega is 192 radians per minute, and so a wk squared effective is 24.3 pound foot squared. Now let's discuss energy absorption and heat dissipation in a brake. The clutch or the brake must transmit energy through a friction surface as they slip in relation to each other. Heat is generated at these surfaces which tends to increase the temperature of either the brake or the clutch. Then you have to dissipate the heat and for a given set of operating conditions an equilibrium temperature is achieved and that equilibrium temperature must be sufficiently low to ensure a long life for the friction elements and other parts in the brake or the clutch. The energy absorption by a brake is equal to the change in kinetic energy, which equals one half I omega squared, or one half M K squared omega squared, but because M equals W over G, this energy absorption equals W K squared omega squared over two G. And if we go through all the unit conversions shown on the bottom, we can write E as 1.7 times 10 to the negative fourth times W K squared N squared, where N is in RPM, and then E, the energy absorption, is measured in pound feet. We can also discuss clutch or brake response time, which refers to the time required for either the clutch or the brake to accomplish its function after an action is initiated by the application of either a current or a pressure or a spring force or manual force. And the typical cycle of engagement and disengagement is shown here at the bottom. The clutch has a certain response time at the beginning. There is no motion. There's just a time for signals to be translated. Then the clutch accelerates. This line here is an idealistic approximation of the dotted curve. Then the components are engaged. So we have this on time where the clutch is engaged and the motor is driving a load. Then we have a certain amount of brake response time. Typically, if it's, a, if it's an automobile, we might have the time it takes to have you push on the brake pedal and then the brake pedal increases the pressure that goes into the brake. Then the vehicle decelerates. Again, an idealized line to simulate this dotted curve. And then the system is at rest and we start all over again. Example problem 22-5 is used to calculate the response time and heat dissipation rate using all of the components that we studied in example problem 22-3. We're going to estimate the total cycle time if the system is controlled by a unit G type brake and clutch system. The system must stay on at steady speed for one and a half seconds and off for 0.75 seconds. We will also estimate the response time of the clutch and the brake and the acceleration and deceleration times. If the system cycles continuously, we need to compute the heat dissipation rate and compare it with the heat dissipation capacity of the clutch and the brake. Table 22-1 is where you get the performance data for typical clutch brakes. And the problem discussed using a unit size G, which has a torque capacity of 240 pound feet, an inertia of 2.29 for WK squared. At rest, it can dissipate 18,000 foot pounds a minute at 1800 RPM, it can dissipate 52,000 foot-pounds per minute. The clutch has a response time of 0.235 seconds and so does the brake. We will be operating this system up to 550 RPM and we will need to interpolate between the heat dissipation data shown for at rest and 1800 RPM. This graph shows you the different times and how we obtained them. The clutch response time of 0.235 seconds, that's here, and the brake response time of 0.235 seconds, that's here, were given to us in the problem. The time at 550 RPM, which is 1.735 seconds, includes our brake response time. 
The system decelerates and accelerates for 0.088 seconds. There it is, accelerating, decelerating. And that was calculated in problem 22-3. And the system is off for 0.75 seconds, which is given in our problem. It was on for 1.5 seconds, but we still continued at 550 RPM up to T equals 1.735 seconds. And that's because it took 0.235 seconds for the brakes to kick in and start decelerating the system. These are the inputs we have to problem 22-5, all summarized in this table in the upper left corner. Call that we use this calculation for T equals a WK squared effective times delta N over 308T to get our 0.088 seconds. And we can calculate what the cycling rate and heat dissipation is because we have a total cycle time of 2.896 seconds. And the number of cycles per minute then is one cycle times 60 seconds divided by our cycle time of 2.896 seconds means that capital C, the number of cycles per minute is 20.7. The energy generated with each engagement of the clutch or brake is 1.74 times 10 to the negative fourth WK squared times N squared. And plugging in our numbers up here, that is equal to 608 pound feet. The energy generation per minute E sub T is the cycle times C times the energy generated with each engagement, 608 times two, because you have one clutch engagement and one brake engagement. In our book, it comes out to 25,200 pound feet per minute. In my spreadsheet, I used some extra decimal places. I got 25,214. But now we have another problem. The 25,214 or 200 rounded off number is greater than the heat dissipation capacity of the unit at rest, which is 18,000. It's less than the 52,000 at 1800 RPM, but we need to figure out where we stand at 550 RPM because we don't have any data in the table. So we're going to compute a weighted average capacity for the cycle. First, referring to our figure 22-15, which was our graph, approximately 1.735 seconds is at the speed of 550 RPM, and the balance of the cycle, 1.161 seconds, is at rest. And from table 22-1 and interpolated between zero speed and 1800 RPM, we get a heat dissipation rate of approximately 28,400 pound foot per minute. I calculated it out at 28,389. Here is my interpolation calculation where I find out that the heat dissipation capacity at 550 is the heat dissipation capacity at zero plus the difference between the heat dissipation capacity at 1800 and zero, so that's 52,000 minus 18,000, times the ratio of 550 to 1800. Then the weighted average capacity for unit G is T0 over T sub T times E0, which is the percentage of the time that the unit operates and dissipates heat at zero RPM, plus T sub 550 over T sub T, which is the ratio of the time that the unit is at 550 RPM compared to the total time, times the energy dissipation capacity at 550 RPM. And when you do that calculation and plug in all these different numbers, we get 24,230, pound foot per minute in our book. I got 24,224, which is close. But either way, the actual heat dissipation may be less than our capacity of 28,239, but not by much. So if you were to go through a real design in this manner, you probably should use fewer cycles per minute.
and generate less heat. And here is a spreadsheet that fully documents the flow of calculations that we've just gone through. Let's take a look at friction materials used in brakes and clutches. Ideally, a friction material should have a relatively high coefficient of friction when operating against the mating materials in your brake or clutch. But you may not want the highest coefficient of friction possible because a smooth engagement of the brake or clutch is often aided by a more moderate friction force or torque. The coefficient of friction should be relatively constant over the range of operating pressures and temperatures. It should have good resistance to wear, good chemical compatibility, and should be environmentally non-hazardous. Table 22 shows different coefficients of friction for general categories of material. When the friction material gets oily, then the friction coefficient goes way down, which is not surprising because oil is a good lubricant. And table 22-3 shows classification codes of the Society of Automotive Engineers for friction materials. They give them code letters, which generally cover ranges of coefficient of friction. This slide shows how we calculate the friction torque and power in a plate type a clutch or brake. As the friction plate rotates in relation to the mating plate, the friction force acts in a tangential direction, producing the brake or clutch torque. At any point, the local pressure times the area at that point is the normal force N. So your normal force N acts axially between the input and the output plates. And the friction force times normal force times the coefficient of friction is the friction force. So your friction force vector is perpendicular to the normal force N. Friction force F sub F equals small f times N. And the friction force times the radius of the point is the torque produced at that point. And the total torque is the sum of all torques over the entire area of the plate, which can be summed by integrating over the area. Conservatively, we will assume that the friction surface wears uniformly over the entire area as the brake or clutch operates. And this assumes that the product of the local pressure P times the linear relative speed V between the plates is constant. Wear has been found to be approximately proportional to the product of P times V. The torque T sub F for friction is equal to the friction coefficient times the normal force times the average of the outer and inner radii. Here the outer radii is on the edge. The inner radii would be at the outer edge of this shaft. So right here where my mouse is. But the last part of this relationship is the mean radius, R sub n, which is the average of RO and RI. So then the friction torque equals the friction coefficient times the normal force times the mean radius. Torque is proportional to the mean radius, but no area relationship is involved in this equation. So we need another parameter. That missing parameter in equation 22-8 is the expected wear rate of the friction material. That comes about from an assumption that a brake with larger area should wear less than one with a smaller area. The wear rating, WR, is based on the frictional power, PF, absorbed by the brake per unit area, A, where the frictional power, P sub F, equals the frictional torque T sub F times the angular velocity of the disc. P sub F is equal to the frictional torque T sub F times N, which is the angular speed in RPM divided by 63,000. And we define the wear rating WR as the frictional power divided by the surface area that the plates are in contact. At the bottom of the slide, we have different ranges to use for wear factor, 0.04 horsepower per inch squared for frequent applications, 0.1 for average service, and 0.4 for infrequently used brake. 
This is example problem 22-6 to calculate wear rating. The problem says to compute the dimensions of an annular plate type brake to produce a braking torque of 300 pound inches, springs will provide a normal force of 320 pounds between our friction surfaces, that's our input disc here and our output disc, which has an outer radius and inner radius. The coefficient of friction, which is small f, is 0.25, and the brake will be used in an average industrial service, stopping a load from 750 RPM down to zero. In step one, we compute the required mean radius, and rearranging terms of this equation, 22-8, and solving for R sub m, we get R sub m equals TF over small f times n. We plug in the numbers from our problem statement and we find the mean radius should be 3.75 inches. And we don't know RO and we don't know RI, so we make an assumption to start that a reasonable ratio of outer to inner radii is 1.5. And using that ratio of 1.5, we can then solve first for the inner radius and then automatically get a solution for outer radius. So R sub M is RO plus RI divided by two, but substituting RO equal to 1.5 RI, we see the mean radius is a 1.25 times RI, which comes out to three inches. And then RO is one and a half times that, which is four and a half inches. And then the area is pi times R naught squared minus pi times RI squared, which with a little algebra becomes pi times R naught squared minus RI squared. And that's 35.3 inches squared. Step four, we compute the frictional power absorbed which is TF times N over 63,000. Plugging in numbers, we get 3.57 horsepower. And the wear rating is then the frictional power divided by our area, which is the 3.57 over 35.3 inch squared, which comes out to 0.101 horsepower per inches squared. And if we go up back to this prior slide, we find that a number very close to 0.10 horsepower per inch squared is suitable for the average service that this problem requires. Now let's calculate torque in a cone clutch or brake. A cone clutch or brake is one in which the external cone surface, referred to as the male member of the cone clutch or brake, forms a cone, that's this dark brown shape, and the internal cone surface is this brown one. They call that in the book female member, partial anyway. And that has the mating surface that's parallel. And the friction torque is equal to the friction force times the mean radius, which equals the coefficient of friction times the normal force times the mean radius but this frictional force is going on an angle. Instead of going horizontal, it's going on an angle alpha with respect to the horizontal. And now we have to sum up what the horizontal forces are acting between the internal member here and the external member there. And we find that the forces are using a little trigonometry, n sine alpha is one force, and that's going to the left. Adding to that is the force f prime f times cosine of alpha, so that's these two terms. And doing the algebra, we get f sub a is equal to n times a sine alpha plus f times cosine alpha. Then we take our equation for F sub A and turn it around and solve for N, which is F A over sine alpha plus F cosine alpha. And we combine it with the equation for frictional torque T sub F equal to small f times N times R sub N. And then we can solve for the frictional torque. 
and that's this equation here on the bottom. Example, a problem 22-7 calculates an axial force in the cone break, so that's our horizontal force. It says here, compute the axial force required for a cone break if it's to exert a breaking torque of 50 pound foot. The mean radius of the cone, R sub m, is five inches. Small f, the frictional coefficient is 0.25. They want us to try some different angles of alpha, 10, 12, and 15 degrees. So to solve this problem, all you have to do is take all these different numbers and plug them into our equation for F sub A, meaning the axial force. T sub F is the 50, there's your 50, is either the sine of 10, 12, or 15 degrees, 0.25 times cosine alpha. Again, use three options, 10, 12, or 15 degrees. Small f is 0.25, our sub n is five, and we have to make sure to convert from the five inches to numbers of feet. That's why we're dividing by 12. And we see here at the bottom that the axial friction force varies a little bit by angle. It's not linear, of course, because these are sines and cosines, but it, it tends to go up a little bit for the higher angles. Let's study friction torque in a short shoe, a drum brake. Figure 22-17 on the right shows a sketch of a drum brake in which the actuating force, a W, acts on a lever, here's our lever, that pivots around pin A. This creates a normal force. There's our normal force down between the shoe and the rotating drum. And the resulting friction force, which is horizontal, is assumed to act tangential to the drum if the shoe is short. The friction force times the radius of the drum is the friction torque, there's our friction torque, that slows down the counterclockwise rotation of the drum. The objectives of this analysis are to determine the relationship between applied load and friction force and also evaluate the effective design decisions such as small dimension A and small dimension. In order to analyze the torque in the short shoe a drum brake, we sum the moments around point A. We have a moment in the counterclockwise direction from the product of W and capital L. We have a moment in the clockwise direction from the product of normal force N and distance small a, and we have a clockwise torque from the product of friction force F sub F and lever arm small b. But we also note that F sub F equals F times N, and then we can revert N to equal F sub F over F, small f being the friction coefficient. Then we write the equation zero equals a WL minus capital F sub F times a divided by small f plus capital F sub f times b, which equals to WL minus capital F sub f times A over f minus b. And solving for w, w equals F sub f times A over f minus b divided by L. Turning that equation around, friction force capital F sub f equals a W times L divided by A over F minus B. And we also note that friction torque, T sub F equals capital F sub F times capital D sub D divided by two. By the way, you may have heard little jingle bells in the background or maybe some crunches. I just wanted to reveal the source of that. This is my new kitten, Woody. He's only two months old. He's got his little jingle bell around and he runs around like crazy. And when I was trying to film, he was running on my desk and he was on my back and it was kind of hard for me to film. That's why I had to take a break. But anyway, I want to introduce him. Maybe he'll star in future videos. Let's go over example problem 22-8 to calculate the force in a drum break. We're to compute the actuation force required for the short shoe drum brake of figure 22-17A to produce a friction torque of a 50 pound foot. We will use a drum diameter of 10 inches, A equals three, capital L equals 15. Take a look at values of F of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. 
and different points of location of pivot A such that B ranges from 0 to 6. The friction force is F sub F equals a 2 T sub F divided by a D sub D. We also have to convert D sub D from inches to pounds to get the units right. So it's 2 times 50 times 10 divided by 12. And F sub F is 120 pounds. Substituting values for small a, capital F, and capital F sub F, W equals 8 times 3 over F minus B in pounds. And we can plot a graph of a W versus B for three different values of small f. And that's what's shown here in figure 22-18. Note that for some combinations, the value of W is negative. That's out here in this tan zone. And that's if the friction force is extremely high of 0.75. And this means that the brake is self-actuating. And if you put an upward force on the lever, that's what would be needed to release the brake. In other words, the brake will just break on its own because it has so much friction. This slide shows how we calculate a friction torque and actuation force in a long shoe drum brake. A long shoe drum brake has a very large arced section on the brake lining compared to the circumference of the brake drum. Pointed up is our friction force. Pointed to the right is our normal force. On the drum, there's also an opposing normal force from the lever and an opposing friction force on the drum, which goes down. And the drum is rotating counterclockwise, but the friction force is going to cause it to slow down. And here at the pivot point on the bottom, we will have moments due to the normal force M sub N and the friction force M sub F, as well as the actuating force up here W. The pressure between the friction lining in the drum is non-uniform as is the moment of the friction force and of the normal force with respect to the pivot of the shoe. We use equations 22-18 and 22-19 to calculate the friction torque on the drum and the actuation force. In this equation for friction force, small r is the radius of the drum, f is the friction force, w is the width of the drum, into the page. So the drum essentially is a cylinder. P max is the maximum pressure at any point along this arced section of the brake lining. And theta 1 is the angle between a line from the center of the drum to the pivot and where this long drum brake lining starts. So there's theta 1. And theta 2 is the angle from the line between the pivot and the center going all the way to where the brake lining ends. Actuation force W equals the normal moment plus the friction force moment divided by L, which is the distance between the actuating force and the pivot. And equation 22-19 results from summing the moments around the pivot and making sure they're zero. These equations here, 22-20 and 22-21, define how you calculate the moment M sub N and the moment m sub f and it's kind of complicated and you may be wondering where does this complex equation come from well it turns out our textbook doesn't explain it but shigley's mechanical engineering design 10th edition does that's another textbook that's commonly used in the field of machine design i won't go over it in detail here Suffice to say that it does involve integrating the forces along the brake shoe, and it takes one, two, three pages to document it. So study this if you want to know where our equations come from. Our friction power is the friction torque times the speed of the drum divided by 63,000. And the brake shoe area A, which is an arced section here, I'm showing you L sub S times W, the width into the page, 
and that equals w times the arc length, which is 2 times r times sine of theta 2 minus theta 1 divided by 2. And our wear rating wr is defined the same as before. It's the friction power p sub f divided by the area. Here's an example of a long shoe drum brake problem to produce a friction torque of 750 pound inches to stop a drum from 120 RPM. The first thing we do is select a brake friction material and specify the desired maximum pressure Pmax and the design value for the coefficient of friction. Table 22-2 gives a number of suggested values of which I've showed a couple here. In this problem, we're going to use the woven material, small f equals 0.25, Pmax equals 7.5. Step two, we propose trial geometries for the brake drum and the brake pad. This book suggests a small r of four inches. It suggests a value of capital C equals eight inches, where capital C is shown in this slide, normal distance from the pivot to the center of the drum. L, which is this distance from the actuating force to the pivot is 15 inches. Theta one is 30 degrees. Theta two is 150 degrees. We solve for the required width of the shoe from this equation, 22-18. And all we do is plug in all the different values of the variables and we get 1.443 inches. Using a round number of 1.5 inches for W, we have to recalculate the maximum pressure because that's inversely proportional to the width. So instead of using 75 PSI, we use 1.443, which is the actual width divided by the original design width of one and a half. And we get 72.17 PSI which is the maximum pressure that occurs in the sweep arc of the brake pad. Key point of the long shoe brake is this pressure here along the brake pad is not the same number along the pad. It varies and that's the definition of a long shoe brake, large arc section, variable pressure. Pmax says somewhere in this brake lining you max out at 72.1 seven PSI in our example. Step four, we're going to compute M sub N from equation 22-20. This here is equation 22-20, where all we're doing is subbing in all the variables in that equation. Note that in this equation, the term theta two minus theta one has to be in radians, which is 120 degrees times pi over 180 degrees, so 2.0944 radians is what's substituted for theta two minus theta one. So make sure you do that in your calculations. We get that the normal moment is 5,128 pound inches. M sub F is calculated from this equation over here. Also plugging and chugging in all the variables and we get 749.8 pound inches. Then we compute the required actuation force W. It's just the difference between the moments divided by capital L, which is 291.8 pounds. And the minus sign for M sub F occurs because the drum surface is moving away from the pivot. The frictional power is the frictional torque times the speed over 63,000. That comes out to 1.428 horsepower. And the projected area of the brake shoe is two times W times R times sine of theta two minus theta one over two. A is 10.392 inches squared. Compute the wear ratio is the frictional power over the area, which is 0.137 horsepower per inches squared, which is a little more than what is needed for average service. Let's discuss the friction calculations in a band brake which is shown in figure 22-20 here on the right. A flex band made of steel is faced with a friction material that can conform 
to the sharp curvature of the drum. And the application of force W to this lever puts tension in the band and forces the friction material against the drum. The normal force causes the friction force tangential to the drum surface to be created, which creates this net torque opposing the drum rotation. The tension in the band decreases from value P1 at the pivot side, so there's P1, to P2, which is here at the lever side. The net torque on the drum then is Tf equals P1 minus P2 times R, where R is the radius of the drum. The relationship between P1 and P2 is logarithmic, where P2 equals P1 divided by e to the f theta, where f is the friction coefficient, and theta is this sweep angle that defines how much of the friction material is up against the drum. And the point of maximum pressure on the friction material occurs at the end near the highest tension P1, so it's over here, and P1 equals P max times RW, where R is the radius and W is the width of the band into the page. And as far as the derivation of this logarithmic expression, it also comes from Shigley's Mechanical Engineering Design 10th edition. This time it takes four pages to do, and you are more than welcome to go through this derivation, which again depends on some calculus. Band breaks come in the simple band break formula, which we've discussed, where the pivot point is at the left end of the lever. In a differential band break, you have a pivot point and you're also attaching the band to a angled portion of the lever, which is a distance E from the pivot point. And in the simple band break, the actuating force W equals P2, there's P2, the minimum band tension, times A, the distance between the attachment points of the band, divided by L, where L is the distance from the applying force a W to the pivot point at the left where P1 acts. In a differential band break, W equals quantity P2 times A minus P1 times E divided by L, where P1 is defined as this location here, so that's tension P1 for a differential band break. P2 is this tension here where my mouse is. E is the distance between the location of P2 and this pivot point, and A is the horizontal difference between this pivot point and where P1 acts. Here's example problem 22-10 on band breaks. We're going to design a band break to exert a braking torque of at least 720 pounds per inch while slowing the drum from 120 RPM. In our first step, we make choices of our design. We specify P max is 25 PSI and F equals 0.25. And we take a guess on a trial geometry. We set R equals six inches, theta equals 225 degrees, which is 3.93 radians, and W equals the width into the page, which is two inches. Note that we need to use theta in radians for the calculation P2 equals P1 divided by E to the F theta. Step three, we compute the maximum band tension P1 equal to P max times RW, which is just 25 PSI times six by 12, we get 300 pounds, and P2 from our equation as a function of P1 comes out to 112 pounds. Step five, we compute the friction torque Tf, which is P1 minus P2 times R, which comes out to 1126 pound inches, which is rather high when we were only looking for 720. So what we decide to do is reduce R from six inches down to five inches and recalculate 
all our variables. P1 then comes out to 250 pounds, P2 at 93.59, and the friction torque at 782 pounds, which is a lot closer to 720 than 1126 was. And in step six, we calculate W using A equals five as an estimate and L equals 15. W comes out to 31.2 pounds. We can compute the average wear rating W from the formula P sub F of the friction power divided by A. The area A equals two pi R, which is the total circumference of our drum and multiply by the fraction theta over 360, which gets us the actual arc length that the band is in contact with the drum, and multiply by W, the width into the page of this band, and we get 39.27 inches squared. The friction power then is the friction torque times the speed of 120 RPM divided by 63,000, which is 1.490 horsepower, and our wear rating becomes 1.49 horsepower over our 39.27 inches squared, which is 0.0379 horsepower per inch squared, which should work for average service.